afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming down on this special Sunday afternoon. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a note to our internet audience watching at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of today's book, you can call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We will get it signed, and we will ship it to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. So this afternoon, Books and Books is thrilled to welcome back our good friend Julie Marie Wade, presenting her new book, Wishbone, A Memoir in Fractures. And this story is almost too good to be true. We had an event scheduled for this book in December, <laughs> I believe. But then Julie broke her ankle. Yeah, so I guess she's starting to collect fractures for her next memoir. She, you've probably heard all the jokes by now, yeah. Julie Marie Wade completed a Master of Arts in English at Western Washington University in 2003 a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry at the University of Pittsburgh in 2006, and a PhD in Interdisciplinary Humanities at the University of Louisville in 2012. And of course, she is a member of the Creative Writing Department at FIU right here in Miami. Among her many awards, she has received the Chicago Literary Award in Poetry, the Gulf Coast Nonfiction Prize, the Oscar Wilde Poetry Prize, the American Literary Review Nonfiction Prize, and grants from the Kentucky Arts Council and the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund, just to name a few. Her previous books include the poetry collections Without, Postage Due, and When I Was Straight, and the essay collections Small Fires and Tremolo. Wishbone is the winner of the Colgate University Press Nonfiction Book Award. Amongst the acclaim this book has received, there's a great, a great quote I have here from Lee Olson of the Bellingham Review. She says, Wade captivates the reader. She masterfully leads her narrative across time and space, across literary forms, delivering the reader with a fresh, enlightened feeling of humanness and what it means to be humane. In all its fractured grandeur, through breaking and reassembling, Wade's wishbone typifies poetic autobiographical success. So, before we bring up Julie, I understand we have a few words from the director of the creative writing program at FIU, uh, another great friend of Books and Books, Les Standiford. Yes. Thank you. I'm the director of the creative writing program, and obviously <clears throat> I was at the head of the fight to bring Julie to uh, FIU. And the fight was with her to convince her that this is the place, uh, best place to come. I'm from a little town called Cambridge, Ohio, and uh, Cambridge, Ohio is not a metropolis. <laughs> but Julie spent a year teaching in Barnesville, Ohio which does make Cambridge look like a metropolis. She taught at a Quaker school, right? And I said, anyone who can spend a year teaching uh, in high school in Barnesville, Ohio, and come out whole, uh, we got to get. Uh, we knew she was terrifically talented. And, but one of the things that we talked about uh, was, uh, Julie asked me the question, you know, what's Florida's stance? They haven't recognized same-sex marriage, have they? And I said, no, but it's going to happen soon. <laughs> well, every couple of weeks, uh, Julie would call up and say, you know, you said that was going to happen soon. I exaggerate, you know. Don't make it, um, but uh, I'm so happy to be up here to say that finally, Pam Biondi and the rest of the state came to their senses and uh, they recognized the union of Julie and Angie. And I just wanted to say, well, A, I told you so, but more importantly, <laughs> Mazel tov. <laughs> So I know this isn't terribly out of character, but I've just been smiling so much since I got here. Um, it is so wonderful to see all of you here. Um, 
And to be able to bring Wishbone back, it was delayed for a couple of months. And I, I have to thank, in particular, Mitchell Kaplan and uh, Christina Nasi for being so kind to push this back. Um, and all of you who waited, I really appreciate it. Um, I saw on the sign outside that I will be discussing my book, and that's always a little daunting. I'm planning to read from the book, too, and I'm planning to answer any questions that you might have, if I can. Um, but I wanted to talk briefly about lyric essays, one of my favorite subjects in the world. Um, I try never to stop talking about them for too long. Um, Wishbone is subtitled A Memoir in Fractures, but um, it's not a memoir in the way of um, an analog to a sort of autobiographical novel. It's put together in um, the form of a collection of lyric essays. And I know that that's a, a phrase that we toss around a lot these days. And so I thought I might try to say a little something about how I, I came to this process of memoir making. Um, Wishbone is my first book. I started writing it um, when I was about 21, when I was a senior in college. I didn't know that I was writing a book at that time, um, but I was doing something that felt a lot like just sort of wandering just a little bit out of the poetry pasture, but it felt very close to poetry, um, just with longer lines and uh, longer periods before breaks. Um, but it felt more um, kind of driven by sound. So at FIU, I'm lucky enough to get to teach lyric essay classes where we talk a lot about what does a lyric essay look like? What does a lyric essay sound like? Um, and most of the time we agree that it sounds kind of like a poem and then it just keeps going. But that there's an attention to some sort of um, prosody that it leads with sound, that it leads with language and image. Um, and for me, when I was putting this book together, I think the analog is much more um, like a visual artist collage making process. Um, it's a memoir in the sense that it's um, self-referential and that it's memory driven, but also that um, that sort of assumption we might have about a collage that um, all of those images aren't just put there at random, but that there's some sort of um, like a thematic underpinning to them. We don't necessarily assume that they're uh, chronologically ordered or that they're causally ordered, but that there's some kind of um, question or idea or even recurring um, pattern and experience that unites them. Um, so after about six years or so, I had been on the books as a poet, but I had been doing this secret thing on the side that had paragraphs instead of stanzas. And I realized that I wanted to make it into a book. Um, and so I'm testing out this theory that a collection of lyric essays probably has to have kind of it has to function as like an overarching collage with these smaller collages within it and I don't know why it's taken me so long to figure this out but um, whenever I read I always just read for like 25 minutes or so and I just pick one of the essays and read until time's up um, but that doesn't really test my theory that theoretically you should be able to move around in this book I hope you can um, and not have to just read one essay and then the next but you could kind of jump so um, I was planning for today um, the first time reading from the new the new version of the book which looks like this um, and I decided that I wanted to read it's still the same amount of time but to move across three different essays and um, also maybe give a better sense of the scope of the book because when you're writing your first book um, it's really like magical and you also kind of think to yourself well just in case this never happens again I want to get it all in so for this I, I started um, before I was born and I ended up in my mid-20s and I tried to cover a lot of what happened in between um, but also choosing how to arrange it. So I'm going to read a little bit from an essay called Carapace which is an early childhood part of the book and then um, a little bit more from an essay called Meditation 26 which is an early adolescent part of the book and then end with part of an essay um, called A Life on Land which is an adulthood part of the book. Um, it will only take 25 minutes, I promise, um, if you're a clock watcher. And um, I think one of the thematic hinges for this um, kind of prose collage is a formative experience. I'm really interested in how we get made. Like, how do we become who we are? If we were someone else to begin with, the same set of experiences might have had a very different effect. So, um, so this is that project. Thank you for coming. For a long time, everything only happened to other people. Dreams were for sleep and hunger was for waking, breakfast for morning and supper for evening. A whole world plotted at coordinate points, the axis of which was witness. Families looked alike and answered to the same names. School was a turnstile of listening and lurching suddenly forward. Churchgoers faithfully covered their heads. Why did they do this? Was God offended by hair? And the sprinklers came on before the sun came up, and the flag came down before the sun disappeared, and there were whole locked chambers in the middle of the day while children were napping, 
when secret business was silently conducted. What I knew of the world, I learned from simple observations and from stories. Stories belonged to books, which were their literal dwelling places, and books became the rough and ragged cottages that characters called home. Like me, they dreamed and hungered, considered obedience and conformity, gazed curiously across the sinews of the world in which they were not yet or fully enfolded. We were the watchers then, a vicarious vocation, standing on the life docks, untying the knots, notaries of the good ship's passage. The first funeral I ever attended was Humpty Dumpty's. His death occurred without warning or precedent as I sifted the pages of my mother goose book. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. The rhyme, arresting in its sadness, compelling first by its seeming randomness, was it foul play? the shoddy laying of stones? How had Humpty come to fall at all? And then by its plaintive hopelessness, could there be no reassemblage? Did no one own a glue gun? Was this truly the end of him, shell of his former self muted in concrete cracked? Lexicon building, euphemism, from the Greek for good speech, the way no one would say he was dead, only that he had fallen. In Vacation Bible School, we read a story called The Fall of Man. I imagine mountains, one helpless body hurtling over a cliff, plunging toward the craggy ravine below. In my story, he pulls the rip cord attached to his knapsack, and all at once an explosion of color. The parachute swirls red and gold, enlarging to fill the cloud-crowded horizon. And the man is safe and happy, and the world does not end. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, our teacher instructs. As she moves through the words on the onion-skinned page, I follow them each with my finger. The title says nothing of women, nothing of snakes, and there is no tumbling, no crumbling, no collapse. What's more, I'm not fond of this character called the Lord God. Why did he plant the fruit tree there in the first place if he didn't want his garden party to eat? Now the teacher leans a felt board on her easel. She places a man figure called Adam, though he resembles Barbie's Ken, beside a tall green tree brimming with apples. Beside Adam, she adds a woman figure called Eve, and beside her, a long, uncoiled serpent, who she reminds us is Satan in disguise. Why are Adam and Eve banished from the garden? What did they do wrong? A dozen hands jut eagerly into the air. The general consensus because they disobeyed God. And what is it called when people disobey God? Her eyes narrow on mine and I look down at my book as a flush floods my face, Julie. After some hesitation, I repeat my own crime, what my mother says I am increasingly guilty of, acting out? Sin, she clarifies. God tested Adam and Adam failed the test. He got a big F on his report card next to obedience. And as a result, he had to be punished. Between the tree and the two humans, Mrs. Walters inserts an angry looking angel waving a fire rimmed sword. All of you memorized a Bible verse yesterday about sin. Do you remember? It begins and the wages of sin. How does it end? Another flock of fluttering hands and someone shouts an answer. The wages of sin is death. Now death I understand. Death is Humpty Dumpty split open on the sidewalk and lights out and going to sleep and never waking up. A night with no morning to follow. Mrs. Walters reminds us the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But because he was hungry, Adam had been condemned to die and Eve was only trying to be helpful. And Jesus doesn't exist yet if you read the book in order. And I am still not sure what any of this has to do with falling. The teacher says we are all already fallen, even if we have no scrapes to show for it, no bloody knees or broken limbs. The sin original, the fate inevitable. Inside each of us thumps a fierce and fractured heart. Lexicon building, Felix culpa from the Latin for fortunate fall, wherein a series of miserable events leads to an ultimately happier outcome. Enter Icarus, enter Sisyphus, enter my mother who says I am headed for a fall. If there were chosen people in the childhood world, 
then Sarah Hodson must have been one of them. Small for her age, with a nymph's demure voice and dancing eyes and tiny diamonds garnishing her ears, she reeked of sweetness, sliding easily into any unoccupied lap, earning the praise of all who observed her. An ordinary day, we sat in our chairs around the oblong crayon marred table. Mrs. Whitehair instructed us to stay inside the lines. We learned the names of the first three presidents whose silhouettes were construction papered on the wall. For snack, frozen cups of half peach sherbet, half vanilla ice cream, consumed with a tiny wooden spoon. Sarah Hodson was absent. Mrs. Whitehair conferred with the principal in the doorway. Suddenly, we were all instructed to stand and hold hands and pray, God bless Sarah Hodson and be with her today. God bless Sarah Hodson and be with her today. I wanted to know why Sarah Hodson in particular and why today in particular, but Mrs. Whitehair held a long finger over her lips and frowned. That night at the dinner table, I asked my parents why the sadness at school and the phone tree and the preparation of casseroles. Is this little girl a friend of yours, my father asked. No. To my mother, well, that's a relief. She passed him a plate of steaming spinach. What happened to her? Why wasn't she at school? There was an accident, my mother said. What kind of accident? Eat your meat. I don't like it. I'm sure everything will be fine, my father murmured. Don't worry your pretty little head. Is Sarah Hudson going to die? A long silence before my mother put down her knife and replied, it's possible. She's in a very deep sleep and no one knows if she's going to wake up. Lexicon building, coma from the Greek for deep sleep, often occurs following trauma to the skull. Think of Sleeping Beauty, think of Rip Van Winkle. Think of spells, which also must be broken. I want to know what happened, I say to my father. He sits on the edge of my bed, pulls the covers close to my chin, a phenomenon he calls tucking. I know you do, honey, but I don't want it to upset you. I don't want you to have any more bad dreams. Do you think Sarah is dreaming right now, and is she in her own bed or a hospital bed? He sighs. When Sarah was walking to school this morning, she didn't cross in the crosswalk like she was supposed to. She probably didn't even look both ways. She saw somebody she knew and she ran out in the street and she got hit by a car. But she lives on the same street as our school. I know. And we have a crossing guard. I know. Did the car run her over or did she just bounce off the hood? I don't think we should talk about that, he replies. She's in the hospital now and her family is there and the doctors are doing everything they can. She's broken some bones and cracked a rib, but with the right care and plenty of prayer, she can heal. Will she have to wear a mummy suit? I don't know. Will she have amnesia when she wakes up? I don't think so. Will she still be as pretty as she was before? He kisses my forehead. That's how I know I've gone too far. Good night, young lady. Sleep tight. But I can't sleep, and as soon as my father is gone, I sit up in bed and switch on the light. The following are problems with this story. Absent antagonist. Who is responsible for Sarah's injuries? Did God smote her? Is being hit by a car evidence of smoting? Most believers would say God allowed it to happen. Maybe God was testing her, lured by a friend peddling fresh peaches or clusters of caution yellow bananas. So if Sarah failed the test, maybe she is to blame, running out into traffic, not even looking both ways. Can you be the victim and the villain of your own story? But what about the negligent crossing guard or the driver of the anonymous car or the witnesses puttying our narrative gaps, suturing our questions along a seam of closure? Lack of motive. To the best of anyone's knowledge, this is a motiveless crime, which makes it a non-crime, which leaves us with that empty bowl of a word called accident. Scrape the porcelain as many times as you like, but no porridge there, no sustenance. And because Sarah was more beloved than most people, because her beauty and innocence were so widely and effusively lauded, what shield might any of us have hoped for? If what we deserve is not what we receive, and vice versa, then the world is a wild machine, plowing these fields at random. Lack of moral. I have learned nothing new from this story. Being careful, looking both ways, I had been told already, as Sarah had, but the knowledge did not save her and likewise would not protect me from harm. 
The unexpected was too powerful, unstaking claims to mastery, reinventing the familiar as foreign. She walked that way every day. She did as she was told. Her mother watched from the upstairs window of their house with the slanted roof, a baby on her bony hip, and the curtain drawn back like a veil. When I was a child, the walls resounded with Joanne, her voice constant as a clock chime, her name permanent as the porch light that guided visitors into our home. My mother's best friend since junior high, Joanne swept through the world on a patchouli cloud, her long skirt swishing, her dark eyes darting swift as minnows. She came for bingo and patio potlucks, always running late and juggling too many bags and stumbling over the straps of her sandals. I peeked out my bedroom door in time to catch the gleam of her smile, her generous hand waving to me, urging me on. Have you ever noticed how the death of a woman is also the death of her name? Men flourish in posthumous prestige. Their commodified monikers turn bequest or monument. Women vanish differently and more completely. And so it was with Joanne. In the winter, when the moles on her back turn malignant, when doctors pronounce the dreaded word melanoma, everyone believed she would survive. Such a strong spirit with a son to raise. God wouldn't strike a woman in the prime of life. But God struck all kinds of people all the time. This I knew, this much I knew. Swaddled in gray sweaters, I stared at the gray rain, bright autumnal world reduced to monochrome. As the months were on, my mother refused to take me with her to the hospital. She wanted me to remember Joanne as she had been, not as the wan and docile woman she had become, blue-complected, bald. But if you care for someone, if you love someone, shouldn't you be there? Shouldn't you go no matter what? My mother shook her head firmly. Joanne understands she wouldn't want you to see her this way. Seeing was believing. My mother didn't want me to believe. Meanwhile, a new girl sits beside me in language arts class. Her name is Mandy Salazar, and she wears purple lipstick and Lee press-on nails. Her lashes and eyelids perpetually sparkle. Mandy struggles with diagramming sentences, so in exchange for my help, she provides complimentary manicures in her makeshift beauty shop. This school thing is just temporary, she tells me with 12-year-old aplomb. I'm going to get my GED and become a cosmetologist. Is that like a fortune teller, I ask, gazing at her through a pungent haze of exclamation perfume? No, silly, it's someone who's an expert in making people beautiful. She files my nails thoughtfully a world-famous cosmetologist. My mother finds a page of notebook paper with Mandy Salazar's name written over and over, my sleekest cursive, a heart adorning the eye, a flower braided into the R. She stops me in the hallway, cryptic, unsmiling. I'd just die if you were a lesbian. I'd just die. When Mandy transfers to another school, we don't speak of her anymore. My mother regards me with suspicion now, skulks off to the hospital. Is Joanne going to die? I ask my father. He turns to me, darkness encroaching under his eyes. It pains him to answer. Doesn't look good. Another equinox, thick fog obscures the sun, frost and fragile blossoms. My mother buys me lipstick and braids my hair. Why don't you like shopping like other girls do? What's wrong with you? And one day, just like that, the walls were silent. Joanne no longer bandied about, no longer echoed. A horrible deep hush had fallen. My mother, dressed in black, drove me to school. I read the sign as we passed by, Holy Rosary, Funeral Mass today, 10 a.m. Lips taut, fingers pinched, all those deaths I've crossed on straw. I remember childhood as a slow incision across the throat, a stencil, a scalpel, a scar. This moment in particular, there I was just sitting in my chair, gazing out the window of language arts class, the teacher again instructing me to pay attention, the desk beside me vacant once more. Across the street and up the steep cathedral stairs, I saw my mother wearing a wide brimmed hat and sunglasses to mask the glare or the tears. Church bells chimed, hordes of mourners spilling into the street. My mother lingered on the landing, watching, waiting, filled with inexplicable dread. 
She had lost someone who could not be replaced. As I watched her, I felt my own self receding, my own good name lost. I knew then there were no unbreakable bonds. My mother took off her sunglasses, wiped them dry. She stood in the gold light facing my direction. It was then I began to raise my hand as if to wave, as if to urge her on, but something stopped me. Something hard and unwilling in me froze. I stared through the window, cheeks wet with tears. How to say this? We saw each other, and we did not see each other. In every life, there comes a moment of emergence. The skin shed, the scales fallen. To be born is to plummet headlong into an unfamiliar sea. No parachutes, no patiently attending skiffs. But let it be said and forthright, there is no disappointment in the water. It's trying to get back, all the fraught momentum hurling you forward, the twist of the will to resist, not the undertow, no, something stronger. Call it the overhaul, call it the revision. To survive is to wash up on this shore. When we left the West Coast, it was without spectacle, so unlike us, unsentimental, abrupt. We smoked the last of our weed and slept on the Spartan floor. I may have crawled into your sleeping bag sometime around sunrise. On waking, we loaded the last of our lives into the car. No one was watching, but we felt furtive, suddenly shy. Try not to look at the world like you're making a memory of it, we said, all the while scouring that panorama for a blessing, gazing after the last seagull like a portrait of our vanishing past. I wondered then if I would ever write about it. I wondered, sailing down Interstate 5, then the 101 for a spell, and back again to a skein of concrete cities we had never seen before veering off into the desert for good. This now did not exist then. The law of the land is learning how to build things. The law of the land is shelter wrought from ruins. Five years ago in spring, out till all hours, chocolate, caffeine, and nicotine, blue veins taut to bursting beneath the startled skin. It was like this, I said, look, I love you. I said, look at the moon and look at me. Tell me one of us is lying. Lake Samish and the shower and the bath and the bed, I get ahead of myself. First, there were tears. First, there was your tiny garden and the hummingbirds coalescing under the stairs. And the evening chill that requires just the lightest of jackets. And the back row of the cinema, where we were all hands and mouths without words. I had loved men before, or I had been loved by men before, or I had been confused before about the heart and its improbable machinations, its imponderable flux. Back in Catholic school, we read the Canterbury Tales. I thought I was in love with Chaucer. And there was a brooch the nun wore in the story Chaucer told through and about her. The brooch was engraved, Amor vincit omnia, and the sister marionette explained, Latin for love conquers all. Afterward, I had a moment outside myself in time, a moment untouched by custom and the future's heavy hand. In this moment, I thought, someday, when I propose, I'll give my lover a ring with those words chiseled inside. It gave me chills to imagine those silver bands, that secret language, our life together liquid as mercury in a vial. It's trying to get back to that moment before the glass breaks and the little gendered beads scatter across the floor, trying to get back to a pure thought, to a dream of love beyond chromosomes and social configurations. I did not want to be a man. I did not want to be with a man. My verbs were wrong and also my prepositions. Underwater, we had no use for pockets. On land, I learned it was possible to tuck desire away. By then, we had entered the nowhere world. No gas stations, no cell phone service, no certain end to the sprawling, sun-laden days. Forget about the birds we knew. Forget about the trees. Someone's pink sofa just shy of the roadside. A few miles past, the matching ottoman, and off in the distance, a recliner capsized between cacti. We laugh 
but it becomes a metaphor for the way we lose things slowly, these incremental progressions of grief, despite the spectral backdrop of joy. In Nevada, it seemed possible we might drown on land, on it and in it, swallowed up as we were in the brown dust, and still the bright roads gleaming extravagance, nothing muted, nothing tamed. We watched a storm gather on this horizon. She had seen tornadoes growing up. I had seen the Wizard of Oz, a sound like sheet metal shaken in a school play to give the effect of rain, to make the audience believe it. Then the puckered sky split and we drove into the downturned mouth of an ocean, gushing over us like a fickle friend. No choice now but to keep going, her hand in my hand, the landscape a flood of torn pockets. Stop. That seemed kind of like a downer. I hope that there was, I hope there was something good in there. Uh, we're uplifting somewhere. Are there any questions that you might want to ask? If not, that's all right too. Like a lot, because you work out for so long, did it come in a rush, and then you spend a lot of time doing revisions. And were there other parts that didn't come, and, and you like had to kind of slog through it? And it, or how did it, how did it come about that way? There wasn't a lot of slogging, but there were a lot of pauses um, because. I find in my own life, and maybe others of you are this way with your writing, that I like to have a whole lot of pots on the stove at once. Um, so it makes it a lot easier if you don't feel like there's this one thing and I'm trying to finish this one thing, but you know, working on a lot of different things at once. And so I didn't really consciously think that this was going to be a book. In fact, because I was always on the books as a poet, this was like my secret little thing that I was doing for fun. Um, and I was doing the poetry for fun, but I was also being evaluated on that. And I wasn't so much being evaluated on this. So maybe around the time that I realized I have a whole lot of like these lyric essays just laying around and maybe I should do something with them, that's when I realized, like, well, this has been going on a long time. This lyric essay thing has been going on for six or seven years. Maybe there's a book in there. But in that way, it's easier when you don't know that you have a book or you're not on a time schedule in the same way um, that, well, those of you who are on thesis schedules and I was on thesis schedules, it's a very different sort of process. So I feel like this was pretty slog free in the sense that I could write when I wanted and then move back to the poetry when I wanted. Um, and that's that's kind of magical. You don't always get that back because then you have other deadlines or other, I want to be ready for X or Y. So there is something I think magical about that first book, especially if it's a little bit off the grid. Nobody knows you're doing it, even you, for a while. But good. Of the book that you started reading to us from later in the book and ended reading yes. to us from earlier in the book, so you went backward, but at the same time you were going forward in time. Exactly. Um, so a more conventional organization would have flipped those around. Perhaps. Absolutely. No, I, I was laughing. I was trying to figure out what would be a good amount of time to read, but that would give a sample of different things in the book. And um, I did end up reading back to front um, and actually sort of back to middle. Um, but it's it is a strange structure. I. What I can say about it is that it felt intuitively right as I was putting it together, but sometimes I look at it and I think, well, you could have put it together a lot of different ways, which I think is true with maybe more experimental or lyric kinds of structures. Um, and so the good news is if you are reading this book, you don't have to be bound by the order in which I've placed these essays at all. Um, I think in some ways I did them more in terms of their length um, and how they fit together with others, there are five parts in the book. And so the, the one at the end is so long, it kind of got its own section by default. But um, it's not a chronological volume, it's true. It starts with a break, a symbolic break, and then it sort of scatters like the beads. Yeah? Uh, in your early childhood section of the chapter, you write a lot about education, the education system and religion. And I took it as a, some sort of critique on how children are supposed to take the rules given to them and live their life. I wanted to know what age and when you were writing this book, or during, during what period did you write it? Because I feel like um, the way we, we would critique religion in the school system would be a lot different from the age of like 18, 19 than it would be from when you were from 26 or 27. So I was just wondering what, 
That's the last essay. It's the last essay in the book, but it's also the last essay I wrote. Um, I wrote it right before we left Pittsburgh to move to that bar boarding school. So I might have written it very differently a year later, too. Um, but I think, um, so I was in my mid-20s when I wrote that essay, but I think um, in some ways I wasn't thinking, I mean, it seems obvious now, right, that it's sort of a critique of education and um, expectations about we should all be thinking the same way. Um, but I was writing it because I really loved, um, in graduate school I started teaching comp, which I'm sure lots of people in here teach or have taught. And it was the most important experience I ever had in terms of discovering that there were names for kinds of essays. Somehow I had missed that. I don't know how. I didn't know about the like the process essay or the literacy narrative, um, even though they made a lot, they appealed to me, but I didn't know them by name. I didn't know, um, I, I think maybe I somehow didn't take a comp class when I was an undergrad and then I was in the position of teaching comp when I was a graduate student. And I just fell in love with the idea of the literacy narrative. And so the way that that essay grows is that I wanted to go back to like, what are all the formative texts of my life? I had to start with the Bible. Like I had to start with Genesis because that was such a big part of my early childhood. And then going through the books um, are actually quite strange. Like the amalgam of books that I found had the biggest impact on me. Um, but it was a kind of process of looking at like, if I had to say I'd been made in my life by seven books, either my response to them or my um, rebellion toward them, what would they be? And so that's just sort of the, the beginning of that. But I was thinking of it more as like, I'm going to do a literacy narrative and then it turned into this really big um, long tracing um, but there's definitely a critique in there that probably would change every year every semester if I wrote it again anything else hi Jody my name is Christian um, when you were reading you mentioned something you mentioned being confused and um, I wanted to understand why you said why you used the word confused and um, you also mentioned about how you had loved men and um, I wanted to know if what was the confusion about? Was it like mm -hmm. towards sexuality or from what you had heard when you were growing up and how you were raised? That's a really good question. Um, well, I guess, yeah, confusion is kind of a big umbrella term for a lot of feelings, but I think uh, more the sense maybe this comes through in hearing just an excerpt of the book, but um, I sort of, I came from a world where there was sort of one way um, that everyone had agreed to live um, and agreed to see the world, and so there wasn't really um, a lot of room in that world for, um, I guess that's why the, the first section that I read mentions conformity so many times. There, there weren't a lot of options to even imagine possibilities that hadn't already been scripted before, So, um, which doesn't seem very imaginative to me. But, um, but I felt confused because a lot of things in my experience weren't matching up with what I had been told um, could be, was allowed to be. Um, so I think that the confusion was a lot of, well, um, I'm told that the world has to be arranged in this sort of Noah's Ark, two by two, one man, one woman sort of way, but that doesn't really match my experience of the world. Um, and so a, a lot of the writing, I think, has to do with looking at a world of dichotomies and just wanting to like open those up a little bit more and figure out like what's really nesting under these dichotomies and how can we split them? Um, hence the fractures in the title. Like how can we break them open? So. Kimberly? Dumpty again. And I really have like a whole new vision, and I thought that was that was really that was that was really great. I never thought about it that way. I thought like it just goes to show, you know, you just it's so wonderful to hear different people's perspectives. Sometimes it just inspires a lot text. of things. I That's was really great. distraught over that. This, was great. This I'm sure other people thought that. And I wanted to read it in light of my um, <laughs> right. I had I needed to get some falls in here so that the, the title would make more sense. But I was always really concerned about falls and, and breaking, um, both literally and symbolically. And then, you know, years later, I confronted that fear. But thank you. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Monica. Um, given that you wrote a lot of these essays a while back yes. and you're publishing now, how do you balance wanting to revise an essay you've written a long time ago and also not wanting to touch it because of, you wrote it in a specific moment in time and that has a lot of value? That is such a good question. That's really hard. I mean, if I, I reread this book actually. Uh, thinking about this reading and then this reading was delayed so I had a lot of time to think about this while I was laid up and um, it's such a young book like when I read it I was thinking oh my goodness you know um, but I didn't necessarily want to change it it's just that you know it was done by my mid-20s and then it was published when I turned 30 and so it has now I'm really excited that it has another life that another publisher wanted it and then it gets to come back in the world now but um, 
but it was at the time um, the essays felt newer. Like once I realized I had a book, there was only a period of about two years before I found a home for it with Colgate University Press. So I didn't have time to do the kind of stewing about it that I might do later where I would think like, oh, but that's so dated. Um, but when I do feel like that, like when I when I read something that is old, um, as I mean, one of the essays in here then takes me back 15 years, when it feels older like that, I also think it's it becomes sort of an artifact. Like maybe for a person encountering it for the first time, it functions in another way. But for me, it's uh, it has that function of like I it's preserved in time um, and it preserves something that I probably wouldn't say the same way or might juxtapose with new information now um, so I guess that's sort of how I make my peace with it too that a lot of projects I have them done before I have any idea where they might go so I'll probably feel that way again and again but I'm trying to think more along the line of trying to make art while you're making it and then trying to let it beat after it's done um, after you know you've revised it as much as the self that you are then can do so um, that's how I rationalize, anyway. Artifact art. David. Yes, I, I'm intrigued with, with your idea that Rip Van Winkle didn't fall asleep, but in fact was in a coma. I was really sinister about wish. these characters, <laughs> how I thought of them. Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot, yeah, there are a lot of good listening, right? There are a lot of people in there who don't quite match up. Like, you know, did Icarus have a really fortunate fall? You know, was Rip Van Winkle, what, what were his circumstances? I think once I got this idea about falling, um, and the foul play that I was sure was involved with Humpty Dumpty from the very start. I just, it was part of that kind of, I mean, well, the fracturing, but the assumption that people are not telling me the whole story. They're not telling me the whole story about a real being, Sarah Hodson. Like, they're not telling me what's really going on with her. So are they really telling me when we're reading about Rip Van Winkle and Sleeping Beauty? Um, they all felt the same to me, really, at that age, right? Living people, storybook characters, they all really felt the same. They felt equally real. Um, and I, I think maybe one of the reasons that I write is because I still don't feel anybody's telling me the whole story. And I don't know that I'm going to get to the whole story, but if I don't write, I know I'm not going to get there. Um, so I, I never believed anybody quite the same way again after Humpty Dumpty. Ooh. I knew there was more going on behind the scenes. Was, yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> so much. So I have, to, I have to write my way toward it, I think. Uh, is there anything else? So I'll just have to say that I actually was taught the first time, I really, when I was little, that it was a political allegory, that it's about somebody You were taught this up front? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. I had, I had a cynic for a father. You had the... I had a very narrow. sanitized world compared to this land. Yeah. It was very... Just Just, just, just say. But, but that it was, and apparently it was, there is a lot of the, the mother goose. Oh, that makes yeah. me feel so much better. So I just think that to be reading a different... <laughs> but yeah. having a different conversation more conspiring against trip. somebody who was up and had you fell yeah. and... All right. Uh, I'm with you. King's horses, that's why they're in there. But just to say, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter, but it's just interesting because I don't think I got many of those narratives without somebody telling me. Uh, this is an allegory or this is a Well, there's thing. another way to read to it. To read it. Yeah. And <laughs> ways of reading right? So I was really important. Important. double meanings. Like, then you were trying to get down to, like, choose one. <laughs> Definitely can choose just one. Yeah. Anything else? If not, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Julie. All right, so if there are no more questions, then a reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time to call the number on your screen. Purchase a copy of the book. We will have Julie sign it for you, and we will ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Also a reminder that all of our live streamed events are archived, so if you don't get to watch something live or if you miss part of it, you can go to the Books and Books website. Go to the live streaming link and everything that we have uh, broadcast here at the store will be sh saved there for you to watch at your convenience. And also a note to all you Books and Books fans out there, uh, we have a brand new location in the Carnival Tower of the Adrienne Arsht Center for the Performing Arts downtown. We have a beautiful new restaurant and bookstore there, so please visit Books and Books at the Arsht. Uh, for those of you here in the house, we have Wishbone, as well as some of, some of uh, Julie's uh, previous titles for sale over there at the counter. She's going to be signing here at the table to the left of the podium. I want to thank our friend Les Standiford for his kind words. And uh, that was just such a lovely reading. Please give another hand to Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>